Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we're talking to Dr. Sai Mott. Sai is an Associate Professor of Biology at Eastern Kentucky University. Hi Sai, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because, well, frogs are fun. I mean, <laughs> I just love listening to them and finding them when I'm working in the garden or finding them when I'm over by the pond, out in the woods, wherever. And I know a lot of our listeners really enjoy the frogs too. So I think this is going to be a conversation that has a lot of interest to a lot of people. But before we go any further, let's take a couple of minutes and just tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, so um, by trade, I'm an amphibian ecologist and I work a lot with uh, behavioral interactions. So I teach some of our upper level animal behavior classes here. Uh, from time to time, I teach our ecology class. And then I also do our um, intro level ecology and evolution class. And so uh, in terms of my research, it's a bit all over the place, but the, the central theme is amphibian ecology. And so I've worked on questions associated with cannibalism and predation and just kind of how amphibian communities are structured. I've done some stuff on kin recognition and how amphibians can actually recognize close relatives and how they base their decisions on that. And then more recently, I've gotten into some more conservation themed ecology research, uh, thinking about things like invasive species and how they uh, affect amphibians and global climate change. And I can probably talk a little bit about that later, but my interests are broad and my undergrad and grad students, I like to allow them their freedom to come up with their own topics. And so as long as I feel like it's within my wheel house, we kind of do anything behavioral ecology with amphibians. That's awesome. Yeah. I was always the person that I was interested in a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And the animal behavior really kind of tied a lot of things together when I look back on, I didn't really see it then, but I've just, yeah, animal behavior is fun. I like seeing how things work together. So it's definitely my favorite class to teach just because kind of what you're talking about students, all of a sudden that aha moment of these things that I think about for humans, oh, they're also equally relevant for amphibians. So, you know, whatever kind of weird stuff you think humans do, amphibians invented that or had been doing it for millions of years already. Yes, exactly. And amphibians are so much fun just in general. I mean, like I said, I, I like a little bit of everything. So yeah, of course I love all amphibians. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're going to really focus today on the frogs. And I know... Some of our listeners probably know the difference between frogs and toads. Some of them might be not so sure about what the differences are. So before we dive into our conversation and potentially lose anybody, let's just start at the beginning and start there. So what are the differences between frogs and toads? So broadly, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. And I'll go into more detail on that. It's mainly a an artifact of the naming system of the taxonomy of amphibians and that toads are a very specific family uh, and the family is called the Bufonidae and they're called the true toads but then there's other things that we call toads that are in different families that aren't real toads and then frogs is a broad term that uh, encompasses everything including the toads and just to make things complicated then there's a specific family of frogs known as the true frogs and so the toads fit inside the frogs the frogs encompasses everything and uh, the idea that then there are families called true frogs and true toads makes me think that some of these other families might be having an existential crisis. Like if I'm not a true toad, what am I? Um, and that's, that's all just kind of an artifact of the naming system. But again, just broadly, all toads fall under the umbrella of frogs. Yeah, there's so many different things in nature, though, that are kind of that same way where we kind of have the big group and then we kind of have the little breaks down. So, and the frogs and toads thing, especially the way you just said it, it always kind of reminds me of 
way, 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 way back in elementary school math class where we learned that all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Right, right. And I mean, morphologically, there's some good ways to separate them out. That things like toads, they're the ones with the dry, rough, warty skin. Those are the true toads anyways. And then if you find a frog that has smooth, slippery, kind of moist skin, that's going to be a frog and not a true toad. So that's kind of just by ID. That's the best way to separate them out. Okay. So how many species do we have here in the Eastern U.S. anyway? So if we're looking kind of east of the Mississippi, it's around 45 or so. And uh, there's definite patterns of biodiversity that you go down to places like Florida and the Southern Coastal Plain. That's going to be your highest frog and toad diversity. And then as you make your way north and west from there, the number of species per state is going to go down a little bit. And so Florida has over 30. Georgia has around 30, 31. And as you make your way up the coast, you get to places like Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont. They have nine or 10 species. And then you get up around Kentucky and Ohio, we're looking at 20s into the teens or so. But uh, for that whole, the whole region east of the Mississippi, around 45 or so. Interesting. And I believe a couple of those are endangered or at least threatened, correct? Especially further south? Right. Down in the southern coastal plain around the Gulf, there's some uh, more specialist species that are either endangered or threatened down there. And as at kind of as you work away from that inland or uh, more northerly latitudes, you get fewer species uh, that are of conservation concern. Okay. And so most of our other species, the populations are pretty stable. They're fairly stable, yep. And we do, uh, less so in the United States, but in, in a lot of places we have data deficient species, which means we don't have enough to know where their populations are trending. But especially in the eastern U.S., uh, species are so heavily studied that we think we have a pretty good grasp on uh, numbers for, for most things. Yeah, and that's always an important point to bring up, too, is mm -hmm. do we even know? Because so many times with some different groups of species, and a lot of times like with the insects especially, we don't know what the populations are. Right, and for some of those other groups, there's not even enough people to, that are studying all the individual groups, whereas I think relative to things like insects and some of the other invertebrates, amphibians are pretty popular uh, study organisms. So, uh, you know, especially in the U.S. in terms of having a handle on things, we can always use more. So if anybody out there is looking to go that way, don't think that the field is saturated. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of people on the ground studying population trends. Oh, yes. I remember back in college when I was doing wildlife biology, herpetology class was always so much fun. And even people who weren't taking the class we were always out there trying to do stuff with the students in the class or just going out on our own. Well, the field trips are the best part. Yes. How long do toads and frogs live in the eastern U.S.? Um, we know in captivity that some am some frogs and toads can live in excess of 20 years. Oh, wow. And it really varies from species to species, but frequently I see numbers thrown around of about three to five years for uh, a lot of species in the wild. And so... This will vary based on predation risk and disease risk and things along those lines. And so kind of in a vacuum, we think of captivity as what's the maximum? They're living more than a few decades. Wow. And does that vary by size? So like a bullfrog might live longer than, say, a little spring peeper? Or is there anything that we know about that? Or is there a pattern? That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I know some part of that is dependent on the habitat. Um, I was very fortunate last winter to go to the World Congress in Dunedin, New Zealand. And they have some very long-lived species there that their, their version of mark recapture studies is once a year, every year, you go to this log, lift it up, there's that same frog, you put the log back down, and then you come back around the next year, and it's still there. And New Zealand is really well known for very long-lived uh, herp species. And so some of that is the temperature. Some of that is just kind of living a low energy lifestyle. And so I suspect that might be a, a common theme everywhere, just kind of how productive is the habitat, how how much access do you have to prey, that the harder it is to live, we see lifespans increasing a bit more. Okay. But several years, at least in the wild, yes. typically, unless it gets eaten. 
unless it gets eaten. We do see in the larval phase, so for tadpoles, they tend to have high mortality just because you have shrinking ponds, you have lots of things that can eat them. And so you will regularly have mortality rates in excess of 50%, some cases in excess of 80, 90% in a pond where most individuals get eaten, but the few that make it out will then go live a live a long time. And so really low survival early on, but then those individuals persist. And that's pretty typical of most organisms, whether we're talking about insects or all the way up to mammals. The vast amount of the mortality happens in those juvenile phases versus once you get up to the more adult phases and stages, that's when the long lives happen. Right. And so things like tree frogs and wood frogs, they may be laying thousands and thousands of eggs, but maybe only a couple dozen actually even make it out of the pond. But then those individuals are, they're good for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think with caterpillars and butterflies, it's like 95% never make it to the butterfly stage. Right. Okay. I know bullfrogs out West have become an invasive species because they're non-native out there. They've been translocated right. and introduced. Here in the eastern U.S., do we have any issues with invasive species? As far as inf invasive amphibians and toads, there's a couple kind of scattered here and there. Like we'll get uh, some of the South American species like the cane toad down in Florida. Yeah. Florida is home to a lot of invasives, but the further you go north and west from there, those numbers really go down. But as our only part of the country that's that, that subtropical habitat where you can get those Central and South American species, that's really the hot spot. Um, and so outside of that uh, specific area, we don't have too big of a problem with invasives. Yeah, I always forget about cane toads in Florida. And Florida is just a whole different world than what we've got up here in Kentucky on so many different levels. Oh, yeah. Uh, you get not only the Central and South American species, but you get things from Asia. You get some African species. It's basically whatever anybody had as a pet that they didn't want anymore suddenly is finding itself in the wild. Right. Which is never a good thing to do for no. so many reasons. Yeah, things like the Burmese python, I think really the, the notoriety that they've gotten has really hit, hit that idea home of, you know, the damage and the problems that could come with invasive species. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, one of the things that I really enjoy about frogs is just that you can find them in so many different habitats and areas and stuff. And you don't have to necessarily be way out in the middle of nowhere to find them. I mean, you can find them out there and it's awesome, but then you can also find them more in town or in our yards. And okay, we all have different yards because some of us live in very rural areas. Some of us live in highly urbanized metropolis areas. Some of us are like we were just talking down in Florida. Some people are here in Kentucky where we're at. Some people are all the way up in Maine and New York. So we've got a lot of different habitats, a lot of different climates, but what are some of the ones that we would more typically find in a very general common backyard or community? Assuming we could actually define a general backyard or community. <laughs> Sure. So if we're if we're talking kind of a subdivision, suburban type environment, uh, most commonly you're going to come across the toads because they are less connected to water because of that relatively dry, less permeable skin. They can they can cruise pretty far away from water. And so that's the, the most likely groups that people are going to have in that sort of situation. Now, if you do have a little bit of water or even a little bit of water nearby, you're gonna get individuals dispersing out away from that. And what kind of species you get really depends on what kind of water body we're talking. And so if you are nearby a, a large pond or a lake, you're gonna get some things like the bullfrogs and the green frogs and the leopard frogs. These are species that have larger tadpoles that are tadpoles for longer and aren't really as uh, susceptible to fish predation and these big aquatic habitats. And so you'll get some of those species. If you have access or have nearby a forested fishless pond, which is one of the more common aquatic habitats in the Eastern US, you're gonna get a whole different suite of species 
for the amphibians that don't do well under the threat of fish predation and they do really well in these fishless ponds. And so these are going to be things like your spring peepers, your chorus frogs, uh, the wood frogs. So it's a whole different assemblage. And then to a certain extent, we can also see some species associated with kind of marsh, wet meadow type habitats. So that's a whole different assemblage where you can have narrow mouth toads and crayfish frogs and uh, pickerel frogs. And so it all depends, uh, but kind of the common theme outside of the toads is nearby access to water that outside of the toads, all these other species are so dependent on available water for both for breeding purposes and also because their skin is a bit more uh, permeable and they can dry out more easily. And so vicinity to water is going to be a, a really important thing there. And then the type of water will dictate what species you get in and around your area. We've got a mix of habitats on the farm. So we get a lot of different species, but I mean, spring peepers, I absolutely love listening to them in the evenings. Gray tree frogs are another one that I find commonly and really throughout a pretty wide range of places. Gray tree frogs and spring peepers were ones that even when we lived in town several years ago, I still heard those all the time. This wasn't a metropolis area by any stretch of the imagination, but it wasn't a speck in the road either. We actually had a square. We actually had several stoplights in the town. That's kind of always the joke is, does it have a stoplight or not? Yes, we had multiple stoplights there. So like I said, it was, it was, a, it was an honest to goodness town. It wasn't just a speck and it wasn't a metropolis either, but I love being able to listen to all those different frogs. And especially you mentioned the spring peepers and the gray tree frogs. Those two species in particular uh, are ones that will kind of opportunistically breed in flooded ditches and some less than great habitat. And so people that are in a more urban environment, uh, they're familiar with these calls, even though they had didn't, you know, trek out to the woods to find them. Uh, yeah, the, the, the amphibians come to them uh, in, in that case. Yeah. And that's what it was when we were in town was there was enough flooded ditches, little wetland areas. There was a little pond a couple of blocks away, which also helped with having some of those amphibians in it. But yeah, that was very much just like you said, those more opportunistic ones that are easier to find in those places. And then now that we're out more in a rural area, we have a, a little pond. We've got lots of wet areas. We've got a creek as well. So we get a lot more variety and diversity mm -hmm. as well. We mm -hmm. get the toad, fowler toads calling, we get the green frogs calling, we get just all kinds of different things. And it's important to note that even though we're, what, Mar in early March, uh, some of the species are breeding already. And so the wood frog is one of the earlier uh, breeding species in Kentucky and throughout its range that uh, they're in the midst of breeding right now. So you can go out and hear them. Um, the spring peepers just within the past couple of days started calling in Kentucky. Yes. So, you know, most people think of amphibians and they think you've got to wait till summer. Everything is starting now. And so if you want to go out and hear and find things, uh, just the fact that it's getting cold at night, still below freezing, that's not stopping them. So it, it shouldn't stop people from going out and looking for them. Yes, especially on the warm, rainy nights. That's mm -hmm. always a good thing. But if you're going out on warm, rainy nights and you're driving around, be careful Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure many people that have followed me on the roads uh, at night get really irritated with me because I put my four ways on and I cruise about 10 miles an hour and just see what you can find. But if you find a kind of a backwoods secluded road and you've got a, a warm rainy night here in March and April, that's the best way to, to see a whole lot of things. If you more or less have the road to yourself and can go slow, you can see potentially hundreds of individuals of half a dozen species in the course of a few hours of driving around. Yes, exactly. But the point being with that deserted road, be careful, have flashers on, be safe about it. Absolutely. Yes. It's fun to do, but you, we have to be careful as well. So uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, kind of cool stories from the field. Uh, I mentioned how, uh, anything weird or strange that humans do, we can look to amphibians as kind of setting the precedent for that. And so one of the things that I've seen a couple times in the course of my research and I teach my students about is something called satellite behavior. And so if any of your listeners have the opportunity to spend a little bit more time in a pond or an aquatic habitat looking and listening for these things, they might come upon some satellite behavior. And what this is, is a situation where you've generally got a, a small number of 
really large, really old males that are the best choice that all the females would pick those males if they had the opportunity. And then you have all these smaller, younger males that don't have the deep booming voice because they're smaller. They haven't grown to these large sizes yet. And so they know that they're not as good as those big, deep, booming voice older males. And so what they'll do is they'll strategically position themselves between that superior male and the females. But in many cases, they try to hide themselves from that superior male because they don't want him knowing that they're they're trying to basically steal his mates. And so the females will hear this deep, booming voice, and they'll make their way over towards him, and they'll come across this other male. And he will try to sell the idea that that was me, and so try to steal some mating opportunities. And so in my animal behavior classes, I ask my students the question of, well, why don't most of the males do this? Why don't they all just cheat? And the problem with this is when you get too many cheaters, the whole system breaks down when the females can't trust males. and the honesty of their calls. And so we do see some uh, some of these low quality males getting punished for this cheating behavior. And so those individuals that kind of skirt the large males, those are called the satellite males. And so just a, a bit of deception uh, on, on the part of the amphibian communities. And there's a, uh, other situations like that where we don't think of amphibians as being particularly crafty or complex outside of maybe their complex life cycle, but they have some fairly complicated behaviors going on as well. Yes, exactly. I mean, those behaviors are very, very interesting and complicated sometimes. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the satellite behavior mating strategies because that is always very interesting with them. Mm -hmm. Any other fun stories that you want to tell us about other things that you've seen in the field? So most of my early work during my uh, my master's thesis and my doctoral dissertation was were based on larval salamanders. But whenever you go to do work with larval salamanders in the ponds, you're inevitably inevitably going to run across frogs and toads as well. And one of the things that had happened repeatedly, uh, I got to kind of personally experience this this strong desire to to reproduce by toads. And I know that will require, require more explanation. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> the, the, pro the process of, of, I'll try to keep this PG, uh, the process of reproduction wherein the male grabs the female is called amplexus. And so this is a very hardwired behavior that when it's time to reproduce, it's almost as if the males are thinking about nothing else. And why this becomes interesting is because males will try to amplex things that are definitely not female toads, just because they're in the zone of it's time to reproduce. And we've seen this a lot with the, the invasive cane toads that if, if anybody has a chance to watch the documentary, The Cane Toads and Unnatural History, they detail some of this, uh, where the, the cane toads will try and amplex a tennis ball or a dead uh, toad that's squished on the road. And why this relates to me is part of my research had me basically sitting in a pond in a lawn chair watching larval salamanders for a couple seasons. And I've been uh, amplexed by toads several times. And you have to think at some point, they have to have some standards or some recognition of this is not a toad, but sometimes it doesn't seem to matter. I've had my boots amplexed, my elbows amplexed. It's just the, the males come in and all they know is if there's something around, I'm going to uh, try to amplex it. And sometimes you can be a, a bystander and get involved in the mix there. So we also see things like what are referred to as mating balls, where you have one female and if the, the ratio of males to females is really skewed, you might have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 males trying to amplex with that one female and you get males amplexing with other males. It's like all rules are off and, you know, they're all trying to get access to the one female. So it's, it, believe it or not, it's an interesting uh, set of behaviors to watch. Uh, and it's made clear by the fact that they have such a limited window of time to reproduce in a lot of these habitats that they have to take some risks or be a little bit less precise, I guess, about what they're doing because the clock is ticking, the pond is drying. And so that driver of the pond is drying tends to shape a, a lot of what we see in amphibian behavior. Yes, exactly. And yeah, I've seen some of those videos of toads trying to amplex the tennis balls and stuff like that. And yeah, one of the things that's really fun to do in the early spring when you know the mating behaviors are going on, even outside of the pond, if you catch a toad, especially 
and you grab it at the right spot, <laughs> you can tell whether it's a male or female based on whether it gives off a certain call or not, because it has a call. If it's a male that just says, hey, wait a minute, I'm a dude, leave me alone. Right. And <laughs> kind of go get the other one to go away. But yes, I've done that before. And it's just a little meh, call something along those lines. And then the, if it was another male, they know I'm wasting my time here. And they move on to try to find the one that doesn't make the squeak noise. Exactly. <laughs> So how would you get started learning your different species of frogs and how to ID them? So the way that I learned how to do that and the way that now I teach my students is to use some of the more common field guides. So things like the Audubon guide and in our herpetology class, we use the Peterson guide series, uh, which is great because they start off with the keys that lead you through the features. And after a while, it becomes a bit of second nature. But if you're new to the process, there's going to be a lot of new words about different body parts and very scientific terms. And it, it'll, it'll be challenging at the beginning. But you'll get to a point probably within your first season of looking for things that after a while you don't need the key and you can just see this and know this is a wood frog or this is a gray tree frog. But uh, using those field guides, I would say, is the best way for somebody to get into the process of IDing species. Yeah, I love my field guides. I use them all the time. And then the other thing with frogs is I actually really like learning them by ear and I can bird by ear. I can do all that. But. I'm more of a visual person than an auditory person. So typically I tend more towards that. I want to see it and mm -hmm. stuff, but with frogs, for some reason, I can pick up on the calls pretty quickly. And so I think that's also a really good way to start to learn your frogs as well, especially if you tend to be more musically inclined or more auditory learner. It's a great way I think to do it, but yeah, typically I'm like, I want my field guide and I want to have it in hand. Right. And I am admittedly audio challenged. And I tell this to my students that I feel pretty comfortable with learning things based on the way they look. Um, but unless it's one of the more common species that I hear every year, I find myself having to retrain myself with the calls. Just I, my brain is not wired that way. But the other thing that I do to try to help with that is you come up with some sort of description for the call that is not just trying to flat memorize the call in your head. And so one of the easier species that we teach our students about is the Eastern narrow mouth toad, which it sounds like a sheep. There's no better way to say it than it sounds like a sheep. Mm -hmm. Some of the other calls are a little bit more challenging and you can get kind of creative creative and, and how you describe that call to yourself, just something to make it stick. But even the best of us people like myself that have to teach that information, I tell my students, calls can be challenging. Oh, yes, they can. And yeah, I'm like you. I, I can't just flat out memorize most of them. But yeah, the narrow mouth toad and sounding like a sheep or the green frog sounding like you're plucking a banjo mm -hmm. or the um, bullfrog saying jugarum jugarum i mean there, there's yeah. just these different things that yeah like you said there's ways to memorize them by relating it back to something else mm -hmm. so what are some of these different roles that the different species play in these different ecosystems so sure uh the big ecological function associated with amphibians is energy transfer you know they're a, a pretty unique link in the food web and what's really special about frogs and toads is because of their, their biphasic lifestyle where we have terrestrial adults and then we have the aquatic tadpoles, they're really important to two completely different types of habitats. They're really important to energy flow in the terrestrial phase and they're really important to energy flow in the aquatic phase. And so uh, for the terrestrial adults, they are really important as serving the bridge from the really small invertebrate prey to the larger predators, things like raccoons and opossums and coyotes and foxes and things like that, that those types of mammalian carnivores don't really access that invertebrate prey directly. They rely on things like amphibians and, and some of your birds to, to complete that energy bridge. And so uh, without the amphibians, energy, energy flow would kind of, it wouldn't stop, but it would slow way down. Mm -hmm. And this is also true in the aquatic phase when you have the, the aquatic larvae that they serve as a way to export all of that aquatic energy in the form of tadpoles 
back to the terrestrial environment. So there's a ton of input of energy when the adults come into their aquatic habitat to breed, and then there's a ton of energy transport back out. They're, they're not only connecting different links in the food web, but they're also crossing that aquatic terrestrial boundary. And we see in a lot of studies that when uh, amphibians either decline or are taken out of the picture, there's a slowdown in that energy transfer, uh, both within that system and then, you know, bridging that gap between aquatic and terrestrial. And I don't know if similar studies have been done for frogs and toads, but there's a very famous set of studies on salamanders that have found that if you go to a particular patch of forest and you catch all the salamanders and weigh them, they weigh more than all your mammalian predators in that same area. So based on abundance and biomass, they're really important to, to, to energy transfer. And I suspect that if we were to do something similar with frogs and toads, we'd find a similar pattern that they're this key link between the stuff that would otherwise be inaccessible to your larger predators. Wow. I hadn't seen that salamander study. That's really interesting. And yeah, I could see how it would potentially be very similar with the frogs as well. And the other thing about the tadpole phase is that amphibians are really unique in that they exhibit what we call a complex life cycle. And that simply means there's a really drastic kind of abrupt change in the way they look and the way they act and their physiological processes between different life stages. And so if we think of something like a human, a baby is more or less a small version of the adult and the way it looks and to a certain extent the way it acts uh, depending on which adults you know um, but for things like amphibians you've got the tadpole phase which is herbivorous in most cases and then you have the adult that is carnivorous and so there's this big changeover but what that means for the tadpoles is they can do a lot to control plant growth in ponds and then sometimes you have some of these individuals switch to start eating some of the animal life in ponds and then when they metamorphose they're definitely eating animal material so they're very flexible in terms of what they can do with respect to energy transfer mm -hmm. and we keep talking about the tadpoles and that's probably something that we should stop and talk about for just a second here is that tadpoles, depending on what species they are, how long they stay as a tadpole can really change and vary because like for the ones that do breed in those vernal pools that may only be around for a couple of months, the development process is pretty fast. I mean, they'll be, they're a tadpole for weeks to months type time frame, mm -hmm. but for some of our frogs, they could stay as a tadpole over winter. So they basically will take, to a certain extent, as much time as the habitat gives them. And so on the on the short end, so in the eastern United States, probably the narrow or the, um, sorry, the spadefoot toads are the extreme in one direction that they can, in some cases, go from egg hatching to metamorph leaving the pond in three or four weeks. So really rapidly developing. And then, like you said, things like the bullfrogs, uh, they can overwinter sometimes as much as three years before they're hitting metamorphosis and leaving the pond because they reach a rapid body size pretty quickly where they're outgrowing the predation risk from a lot of things. And they can just hatch hang out and grow a little bit more slowly and take their time. And these are in more permanent habitats where they don't have to worry about things drying out. But uh, yeah, they can they can absolutely take their time. And even the species that breed in those temporary ponds, they're flexible as well. And so we refer to that as phenotypic plasticity. The plasticity means they can take a little bit longer if you get a lot of rain and the ponds stay filled for longer. They will take that time if they can get it. But if you get a hot year and the, the pond's really drying down, they can take less time. And usually the trade-off is if they get out quick, they metamorphose at a smaller size where they might be more susceptible to predation after they leave the pond. Whereas if the pond stays filled for longer, they can take their time and get out at a, a bit larger size where they're not as vulnerable, vulnerable to predation. But that range, you can find that just within the species that breed in the temporary ponds. And then we can look at the species that breed in permanent ponds. They are similarly flexible that um, even if we have a permanent pond, if a pond is drying down because of uh, hot weather, they can still modify things to get out sooner or later, depending on what the conditions are like. Yeah. Frogs are just interesting. I mean, we said they it at are. the beginning. But okay, so you've kind of alluded to this a couple of times, but I do want to go ahead and bring it out and talk about it a little bit more. What are some of those threats that are facing frogs? So just to give you a number kind of going into this to give a sense of how threatening are the threats that the the most recent estimate is that around a third of all amphibian species worldwide are 
globally threatened or threatened with extinction. And so that's a huge chunk and that's bigger than things like birds and mammals. So as a, as a vertebrate group, they're incredibly uh, at risk. Historically, the biggest threat has been habitat loss and habitat fragmentation and habit habitat degradation through pollution. A lot of the wetland areas that are home to a lot of amphibians are places that we have liked to drain for development. And so places like California have lost 90, 90 plus percent of their historic wetlands. And a lot of the states along the Ohio, Mississippi uh, River drainage area, they've lost at least 50 percent of their wetland areas. And so even if those areas aren't lost completely, a lot of times they're chopped up, the habitat's fragmented, where it becomes a very difficult for individuals to move from one habitat patch to another. And so that was the big issue uh, for the last couple hundred years, I suspect, but now we have other threats uh, emerging on top of that. And so uh, things like pollution, acid precipitation have been an issue be because amphibians are so susceptible because they have that relatively permeable skin. They don't have a hard shell or anything to protect them. Uh, they're really susceptible to that. We have some issues with invasive species, and we talked briefly about the cane toad as an invasive itself, but amphibians themselves are susceptible to species invasions and uh, part of my research looks at the role of invasive honeysuckle which is I, I, I broadly would say everywhere 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 in Kentucky but it's all over the place and we're finding that that can dramatically change the habitat for the adults and then my research focuses more on the aquatics and we find it's really bad for the uh, aquatic habitats as well uh, so invasive species are in there something that's a little bit more specific to amphibians is the idea of emergent other or otherwise invasive diseases mm -hmm. and so two of the big ones that have been in the news for over a decade now are ranavirus and chytrid fungus and there are several hypotheses about where these pathogens came from there's an out of africa hypothesis and out of asia hypothesis a novel pathogen hypothesis and those are actively being debated um, but what we do know is that these types of pathogens are really causing fast and significant decreases in amphibian populations. And these are things that, uh, in the case of chytrid fungus, this is a fungus that when an individual is infected, it, it affects water balance and things like that and uh, makes it so that the individuals die. So there's a lot of work being done to just try and figure out what can we do about that. And uh, research, researchers have been working on chytrid fungus in frogs for decades now, and the newest threat is the salamander chytrid fungus, which is in Europe right now, and we're trying to basically put a lockdown on the U.S. and through the pet trade uh, to make sure that that doesn't become an issue here. And so on top of all this, not to, not to go too gloomy, but on top of all this, we are seeing some effects of global climate change on amphibian populations. We are seeing interactions between climate change, and some of these things like disease. We are seeing cases where populations are moving to more extreme latitudes, basically running from the equator to the poles as things warm up. We're seeing species that live on mountains move further up the mountains as things warm up, and at some point they're going to run out of mountain to climb up. And so uh, it's just uh, one other thing on top of the historic threats. And so, you know, habitat stuff has been going on for a long time, but it's just been within m relatively more recent time frame that some of these other threats have emerged. Right. And I mean, amphibians in general are often considered one of the canaries in the coal mine. Right. Because especially when it comes to climate change, I mean, they are and habitat degradation. They are such indicator species sometimes. Right. And we think that we're going to see the effects of things like pollution and climate change in the amphibians before they get a chance to get to some of these other groups. And so, yeah, like you like you mentioned, the canary in the coal mine, when we see things happening within the amphibians, it's not just a case of we only have to think about the amphibians. We have to think about what are the what are the potential effects going to be on the other groups and, and humans as well. Yeah, exactly. And you said something in there that I wanted to go back to and talk a little bit more about because that's potentially really interesting. You were saying with your research, you're finding honeysuckle mm -hmm. is causing issues with the habitat and stuff for the frogs and other amphibians. Can you talk about that some? 
Sure. So this is something that I never really anticipated was going to be the focus of my research because I did a lot of community ecology uh, work and I had a, a grad student that was interested in this idea of what honeysuckle and invasive plants in general, uh, what those invasions mean for amphibians. And there was some work done uh, a little over a decade ago on uh, adult amphibian communities finding that when you have these areas that are heavily invaded by honeysuckle, you tend to find fewer and different types of amphibians there, just based on some of the changes that the honeysuckle imparts through changing the, the, the rest of the plant community and things about the soil and those nature and those things. And so uh, we knew a little bit about what was happening for the adults, but the the amount of work done in the in the larval stages was relatively limited and we we knew as much as that when some of this leaf litter gets in the water it rapidly decomposes and it's uh, like we teach about eutrophication in our intro ecology class is that that rapid decomposition of those leaves really sucks all the oxygen out of the water. And those leaves are at the same time releasing uh, these things called uh, phenols or phenolic compounds, things like tannins mm -hmm. that can seemingly stick to the gills of larval amphibians and make it difficult for them to breathe. And so we wanted to look at this using uh, one of my preferred research approaches, uh, what we call mesocosms, which are basically cattle tanks that we fill up and make it like as close as we can to a real pond and we can replicate it that way. And we started off with a really small amount of honeysuckle leaf litter. And I can't remember what the exact amounts were, but it was basically we put in a ton of native leaf litter and then just a dash of honeysuckle. And just that little bit was enough to dramatically change uh, the way that this kind of pseudo pond habitat looked and acted. One of the things that we saw is that immediately it smelled horrible. It smelled like rotting leaf litter. And when we took off one of our lids off of our tanks, we have these big mesh lids, just clouds of mosquitoes came up that before we had a chance to get the lids on the tank, these tanks with honeysuckle smelled bad enough that they were basically a signal of poor water quality, which mosquitoes love. And they got in there and bred really quickly. And we had just thousands and thousands of mosquitoes in our honeysuckle tanks. And at the same time, the water quality was so bad that almost none of our gray tree frog tadpoles survived. Even, even though we went well below the concentrations of honeysuckle leaves as anything we had seen in the literature. And so that was our first indication of this could be bad. And yeah. we did a little bit of field surveying that first summer. And luckily uh, around our field sites, we didn't find too much honeysuckle around our ponds, but we know that it's out there and it's, it's, it's expanding its range everywhere. And so then I had a, a second set of experiments where we tried even less honeysuckle leaf litter just to see if we could find some sublethal le uh, level. And our great tree frog tadpoles did pathetically in, in that one as well. We had near mortality. And in that particular study, we also saw major shifts in the invertebrate community composition that the only thing that was left over were some adult beetles that were air breathing but would cruise around under the water, whereas things like mayflies, which are very sensitive to water quality, they were all wiped out. And so even if the amphibians in some of these cases live, the nature of the invertebrate community around them is going to be completely changed. So there's a lot of different things going on there. Wow, that is very interesting and scary. Definitely interested in learning more about that. I'm gonna have to look at those papers. Um, so are we talking about Japanese honeysuckle, the vine? Are we talking about bush honeysuckle? Are we talking about both? Because I mean, Japanese honeysuckle and the bush honeysuckles, they become pretty ubiquitous in the environment, especially when we start looking at more of the built environments, whether you are in a rural area or more into the urban suburban areas. I mean, we find honeysuckles, either bush or Japanese, pretty much everywhere now. Right. And so we were working with Amur honeysuckle, which is Lanicera macchiae. But from the literature, it seems like this type of reaction is common to a couple different honeysuckle species. And it's common to the species that are not only grow here, but are still being sold by various stores, uh, which is a whole other can of worms. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but the types of effects that we were seeing seem to be fairly common with uh, many different invasive species, that there's other invasives out there that people have done similar studies and found similar, uh, similar results. And so would it be a pretty good assumption to assume that most things in Lanistera, the genus, would probably be similar? 
I don't know offhand, but just based on the uh, three or four species that I've seen research on, I, I, it seems to be a, they seem to act a similar way once the leaves get out in the environment or once the plants get out in the environment. Okay. And then the other thing with that too, is that not only are we potentially reducing the habitat quality for the frogs, for the other amphibians, for the macroinvertebrates that are really good for the ecosystem, but we're also potentially creating worse mosquito problems, it sounds like. And I mean, mosquitoes are something that everybody wants to reduce the populations of as much as possible a lot of times. So I would, I would be interested uh, in looking at some of these really heavily invaded areas to see what the mosquito populations are like, because uh, we, we really tightly control our ponds and, you know, we added the, the honeysuckle directly, but there's lots of places in Kentucky and elsewhere where you have ponds surrounded by really thick stands of honeysuckle that uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, looking at that kind of variability in the wild, but it would be interesting to see what, what's happening with water quality at a, at a large larger pond scale and with things like mosquito abundance, because yeah, beyond the effects of amphibians and inverts, we could think about that in terms of public health concern. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that you were working on Lonicera macchiae, a myrrh honeysuckle, I find even more interesting too, because that's one of the really early blooming bush honeysuckles. And that's why a lot of people really like it that I know who have it or who've asked me about it because I'm always like you got to get rid of the bush honeysuckles you have to get rid of it. they're such invasive species and I've had a lot of people come to me and honestly asking and I have no problem with trying to learn more saying but wait a minute Shannon you're all about pollinators and you're all about I mean they know I'm a beekeeper as well and they're like the honeybees and all the native bees they go crazy over it in that early spring time period and some of your early butterflies you'll see on it as well so it's just providing all this nectar for so many different species. And then they're like, in the fall, the birds come in, they eat the berries. And like, how can it be bad? And then we have to have the discussion about taking over everything, reducing floral diversity, how that affects just everything else from the songbirds, because you don't have the caterpillars and these bigger, broader pictures. And then the songbirds that are eating the berries usually aren't getting the same nutritious quality. And so it's, it's a bigger, broader conversation. There isn't an easy set answer here where you can't just focus on one thing, but yeah, the decreasing the habitat for all of our aquatic species, changing the, even it sounds like you were talking about for the adult frogs, when, even once they come up on land, it changes everything and then potentially causing more mosquito habitat, which like you said, goes into the whole human health and safety issues. I mean, it's complicated. That's, that's science. That's nature. Yeah, it's complicated. And we have to, like you mentioned, we have to take a really long look at this, not just in the short term here. And now you mentioned the, the flowering phenology, that it's flowering earlier. Uh, we have one of our ecology classes we focus on invasive species and one of the, the things that the students are able to discover for themselves every semester is that honeysuckle leafs out earlier than most native mm -hmm. species and it hangs on to its leaves mo uh, longer than most of the native species. And so it's traits like that that help it do well. And yes, we do have some species that capitalize on that, but uh, again, we have to take a, a broader perspective and see what's what's the net result. You've, you've got some of these pros, but you've also got some of the cons that we need to do a bit of a, a cost benefit look at this. Yes, exactly. Like I said, that's, that's really interesting. I, I need to read up more on this. Yeah, we're only uh, two projects into this, and I thought it was going to be this one-off thing, and we get all these really interesting results. And like I said, apparently this is something I do now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the sign of a really good science project, I think, and a really good research study is when you end up with more questions than answers. Oh, sure. And that's what we tell students is, uh, you know, coming out of your thesis, if you feel you've settled nothing and instead you've set up 10 more projects, that's pretty much the expectation. Yes, exactly. So one of the things I really wanted to talk about, too, is, and this really leads right into it, is what can homeowners do to really improve the frog and toad habitat in their own yards and in their communities? Because I know I get a lot of questions from people saying, oh, I love frogs. What can I do to make my gardens better for them or my backyards better? Do those little toad houses work? 
So what can we do besides removing all your bush honeysuckle from your habitat? <laughs> so not that, I, not that your audience probably needs the plug, but an adult amphibian can eat in excess of 100 insects a night. And so uh, I'm preaching with choir, but yes, you should want frogs and toads on your property. Uh, and especially you mentioned, uh, how can I get them in my garden? That I like to make the comparison that some people get chickens to try and take care of the pests in their garden, but chickens have a sometimes nasty habit of sampling the plants themselves, you will not get the same problem with frogs and toads. So they are potentially a superior pest control organism. So uh, for things like toads, which require less direct connection to water, it's really about providing small habitats. So the things you mentioned, the toad houses or something like one of those terracotta pots flipped over with just enough, enough space to get under, that's probably sufficient for your toad colonization project to start. In, in kind of a more general sense, if you can create aquatic habitats, that's going to be better for some of the frog species. And I know one of the big concerns is, but if I go creating aquatic habitats, am I not also creating mosquito habitats? And there is a balance there. And so what a lot of people do is they'll take a bird bath, uh, the bowl part of it, put it on the ground with water. That's all something like an amphibian needs to just once in a while jump in. They don't drink with their mouths. They soak up water through their skin. So they just need somewhere to jump and then they'll be on to the next place. And something easy like that, you can dump it out every couple of days and fill it with fresh water so that you're not creating mosquito breeding ground. More involved things in general, I, I hear the term of de-sterilizing your property a lot, that using things like pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer even, those things can be detrimental to amphibians because of their really sensitive permeable skin. And so trying to minimize or avoid using compounds like that is only going to help your, your amphibian population. And so leaving things, other cover objects like rocks and logs, making your property a little bit more natural, especially creating some moist, humid microhabitats like the kind you find under rocks, under logs, that's going to be your best thing. Uh, and it's really about just creating the habitat because once the amphibians are there, as long as you keep uh, those structures there, and if you're if you've got these bird bath structures, as long as you keep them there, you can have the same amphibians on your property for years and years. It's not something that's going to require a ton of maintenance. Once you get them there, they're there unless you do something to drive them off. And what about making ponds? Does that help out? So that can help, and that that gets into that question of how much upkeep do you want to have with trying to control things like mosquitoes. Myself, I think of mosquitoes as just frog and toad food and, and larval salamander food in the case of the larvae. And so for me, that wouldn't be a big issue. And so if you're not necessarily concerned about that and you want to promote all the other things that eat the insects, amphibians, bats, creating a pond can be a great way to do that. And so depending on how big or how small you want to go, that can to a certain extent dictate what kind of species you're going to get on your property. And so if you want to dig a nice big permanent pond, you're going to get the bullfrogs and the green frogs and things like that. Something a little bit smaller, it may take a little longer for things to colonize, but uh, I've seen people that just more or less dig a depression in the woods at the edge of their property. And within a couple of years, if that fills up, you can have things like wood frogs and some of these uh, fishless pond dwelling species. And so sure, ponds are a, a, a great way to, to promote amphibians on your property if you have the means of doing that. I mean, like you said, it doesn't take much usually to really get them coming around your area. Right. It's And one of the counterintuitive things is as long as you're putting out these structures to create the right microhabitats, less is more. You can definitely overthink these. Uh, I think of this, I think of providing habitat for frogs and toads, almost like trying to take care of a succulent. It's easy to do too much. And, you know, some things thrive on almost neglect. And so frogs and toads are along the same lines. Once you get them the habitat, once you get them there on your property, you basically don't need to do anything else. And I mean, I know, like I said earlier, with my property now, I've got lots of space and there's lots of natural water sources out there for them. But I mean, I'll find tree frogs in my cup plants. So I've got cup plants growing and for those that haven't heard me talking about them or don't know what a cup plant is, it's one of our native wildflowers and it's very closely related to the sunflowers, but the leaves will come around the stem and they form these waterproof 
cups basically surrounding the stem and then that waterproof cup will fill up with water during heavy dews or rains and stuff and the birds will come down and drink out of it and you'll get butterflies and bees and stuff drinking out of it you'll have sometimes tree frogs in there they'll just kind of be sitting in the cup looking at you like okay go away i'm in here now and, and with the great tree frogs, uh, specifically, there are species that you, we mentioned earlier that you can find even kind of a suburban uh, atmosphere. And so they might have one or two trees that they use as kind of a home base, but they may visit various parts of the subdivision. And so if you can have little hiding spaces for them too, they may not be permanent residents just at your property. Um, but if you have, you know, the right type of structures where they can get in, I've seen them go frequently behind the shutters uh, on people people's houses or in the rain gutter, you know, somewhere along those lines. One of the one of the things that a lot of people will do when specifically working on things like gray tree frogs is they'll cut a couple sections of PVC pipe and just put it up on the side of a structure and they'll get down in there because it's nice and humid and uh, and warm. And so there are those are some a little bit more involved ways when using things like PVC tubing. But you can, to a certain extent, kind of even target which species or which groups you want coming to your property. Yeah, and the rain gutter is a favorite of the gray tree frogs here. Mm -hmm. We've got one that every year it'll be up in the gutter and it just sounds so funny when it starts calling in the gutter and it just kind of vibrates and echoes. And that's probably benefiting its fitness. It's acting like a megaphone, letting all the, the females know where he's at. Oh, yes, <laughs> I'm sure it does. Okay, this is a little off topic, but still kind of talking about frogs around the home. I know a lot of people, they'll take their house plants outside during the summer and then during the winter, they bring them back in and it's pretty common. I get quite a few questions about this and comments about it where later on, sometimes it's pretty quickly, sometimes it's a month or so later, they'll be watering the plant and they'll notice that there's either a frog buried down in the dirt or maybe there's a little tree frog on the vegetation. They're just kind of looking at them. So what do they do? What, what's your suggestions on that? Oh boy. Uh, so I've seen various approaches and admittedly, I haven't had to do this. And so I have not had a chance to kind of weigh the pros and the cons. I know lots of people just put them in an aquarium and keep them fed throughout the winter and wait till the next time they can release them back outside. Um, I know some people have tried to get them to go in this, in this state of torpor, almost like a hibernation where they'll put them in their fridge and or some other way to slowly cool them down and they, they almost shut down and then they keep them that way over winter. Um, I honestly don't know what's, what's a better approach, uh, but those are the two common strategies I tend to see. Okay. Yeah. Most of the people that I know that's had that issue, they keep their house kind of cool anyway, or they keep the plants like in a sunroom mm -hmm. type area where it's just kind of like semi-heated, maybe 50s-ish, 60, something like that, not super hot. And they've just been able to let, especially if it's kind of buried down in the dirt, just kind of leave it there. Just let them sit. Let it sit. And it just kind of sits there and they've always put them back outside with the plant in the spring. And that seems to have worked well as well. I have heard some cases specifically for the wood frog because uh, I have kind of my list of interesting facts here towards the end. But with the wood frog, in their native habitat, they let themselves freeze during the winter. Mm -hmm. and so they have high concentrations of glucose that almost acts like antifreeze around their vital organs and they let the rest of their body freeze. And I know some people have found wood frogs in the leaf litter in um, like a window well or in a planting box or something and they throw them in the freezer and just thinking they're replicating what happens in nature <laughs> and I can't imagine that that works out well because this is a gradual process in nature and it's not just like one day it's 65 and then you're frozen um, so I would recommend not going with that approach but uh, with the wood frogs during that off season out of the reproductive season they're looking to get buried down in something and so you could have a, a pot with soil and leaves or an aquarium or something and they'll probably just get down in there and hunker down and hang out for a while yeah I love wood frogs they're one of my favorites just just because they are so cool and they can do so many different things. So since you brought it up, go ahead, tell us about the wood frogs. <laughs> okay, so the wood frog is one of the few amphibians that we actually find north of the Arctic Circle because they have this strategy where 
it's almost like they're giving up during the winter time. And I teach my, my ecology and evolution classes that when you're faced with a stressor, you've got three choices. You can move, adapt, or die. And so they're not moving in the sense of they don't do any mass migration when winter comes. They've basically got to find some way to adapt in place. They don't do a, a ton of burrowing. They're not getting down several feet down below the ground. They're basically, their adaptation to a certain extent is giving up and just saying, I'm going to allow myself to freeze, but natural selection has favored the, the concentrated glucose in their body that's just around the vital organs, and they can stay frozen for months and months and months. And there's a, a couple really cool YouTube videos that document this, uh, this process that then when spring hits, they start to thaw out. And they're very slow going at the start because, hey, I'm unfreezing here. Uh, but then within a little while, they're back to normal and they're out looking for their mate. And so this is uh, something that I know industry has looked at to a certain extent for kind of cryopreservation techniques, um, but it's it's one of the one of the marvels of amphibian ecology, something that you find north of the Arctic Circle. And yeah, I've watched some of those videos and it is absolutely amazing to watch it happen. But yeah, don't throw a wood frog in your freezer just to see it. Ha no, no, that's not the way it works. If anything else, that's the tip of the day. Yes. <laughs> So do you have any other cool things that you want to share with us? In terms of kind of myths and myths, misconceptions, you cannot get warts from handling toads. Yeah. Uh, the biggest risk you have is getting peed on from handling a toad because that's one of their more common defense mechanisms. But I've been handling toads for, oh, greater than 30 years now, and my hands are remarkably wart-free, uh, as are all the other herpetologists that I know, so that is not something that can happen. Um, however, when talking about toads, they do have very prominent poison glands, and I wanted to bring that up briefly. So behind their eyes, you see kind of these uh, little uh, hump-shaped structures. Those are called parotid glands, and those actually do contain poison, and it's a defense mechanism. And so along the lines, going back to one of your uh, previous questions about how do I make my property better for frogs and toads, you want to watch uh, leaving your pets to just roam free range if you're trying to bring toads in, because there are cases of dogs and cats trying to grab a toad and getting a shot of that poison and having really negative results there. So you just want to keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of people know about the effects of house cats on things like songbird populations. That's been really well publicized, but they can also uh, really put a hit on amphibian populations as well. So just something to be uh, aware of. And so the one thing I wanted to mention kind of uh, with with a tie into conservation is that even in places as heavily populated as the United States, we're just still discovering new species of amphibians and frogs and toads. And some of the more highly publicized cases uh, about maybe six or seven years ago, there was a new species of leopard frog described uh, originally from a location in and around New York City. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most heavily populated places in the world, and there's a new species just kind of right under our nose. And it was very subtle, the differences in call and genetics and things like that. Um, and subsequent work found that it's kind of all down the Atlantic coast, um, but we're not at the end of our count of species, even in places as heavily populated and well studied as the U.S. And so um, just kind of as a pitch, if anybody out there is looking for areas to get into research, don't discount this idea of looking at the diversity that we have, even in places like the U.S., because there's hidden diversity out there that we haven't documented. We are still at a place where we're naming things at the genus level, which is huge. It's not just new species. It's totally new genera, which is, uh, which is really astounding. And so don't discount, you know, looking at biodiversity, even, even in places like the Eastern U.S. Yeah. And I love that. That's been a theme that's really been hit on by quite a few of our guests recently is just this biodiversity that we're still learning about and recognizing. And it's not like people didn't know that these frogs were out there. It's just that nobody recognized that it was something different or something unique and special. And the same thing with so many other different types of organisms too. Sure. And we think, we think about places like the New World Tropics, and we know there are undiscovered species there. But when it comes to heavily populated areas around us, we just think that, well, we've covered everything. And you know, using genetics has opened brand new doors for identifying these species, but some of the discoveries we're making are still based on basic things like the way it looks, the way it calls. And so, um, you know, we haven't 
reach the end of our list, you can go. I know we're, we're going to talk about resources for people to uh, to consult. The Amphibia Web website is great in it's amphibiaweb.org. Pretty much on a daily basis, they give a list of what new species were described today. So if you want to keep up with what species are even being described and where kind of worldwide, there's some great resource, resources out there for that. That's awesome. This has been fascinating. If people have questions about frogs or want to learn more about your research, because you've got some very interesting things going on with your research. And I know that some people might just be interested in learning about it for knowledge sake and others, they might be students thinking about getting into this field. So looking for schools that have really fun projects going on and professors that are into this sort of thing and doing this research and want to help them. So if people want to get in contact with you, learn more, can they contact you? Sure. So there's a couple ways and a couple different resources. Um, if you just want to email me directly, uh, my email is cy.mott at eku.edu. I also maintain a lab page that admittedly is not as up to date as it needs to be, but the address of that is motlab at weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com. So it's all one word, M-O-T-T-L-A-B, motlab at weebly.com. We also have, uh, through our, uh, our department, we have the EKU Herpetology Facebook page. And so we've had people uh, send us pictures and what is this? Is it what I think it is? And they just want to do an ID and I just make sure they're not a student in my class because I won't do their IDs <laughs> for them. Uh, but if you have questions or want something ID or just want to talk about amphibians, frogs and toads, you can drop us a line and at the EKU Herpetology Facebook page. And for potential students out there that are interested in uh, doing stuff with herps, EKU in general and other schools in this uh, in this region of the country are they tend to have at least one herpetologist on staff. And so if people are considering undergrad research or grad school and you just want to talk, you know, what is amphibian research like? Feel free to, to reach out to me using any of those uh, any of those mechanisms. OK, that's awesome. And I will definitely have links in the show notes for size email address, the Facebook page, his lab's website. He also sent me several other resources that he thought might be good for people who are wanting to learn more. So I'll have links to those as well in the show notes. But yeah, this has been so great. Thanks for talking with us today. I'm always happy to talk frogs and toads. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. I greatly appreciated Cy taking time to talk with us about frogs. Frogs are just so much fun to observe and learn about. And since so many of us enjoy having them on our property, I was glad that Cy shared some ways to make our yards more frog friendly. I'm also very intrigued by his honeysuckle research. I know that bush honeysuckle can have all kinds of negative impacts on terrestrial ecosystems, but I never dreamed that it could have that kind of impact on aquatic ecosystems too. The potential mosquito connection is also very interesting to me. I'm going to follow Sai and his students' future research on this subject and may invite him back one day just to talk about that specific topic. I also found a story about the new species of leopard frog that was identified near New York City very inspiring. To me, this continues to show the importance of paying attention and sharing our observations. This frog was living in and around one of our largest cities, and yet it was only recognized as its own species within the last decade. Once again, it just goes to show that we never know what we might find in our own yards or communities if we take the time to look. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask a favor of you. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider joining our community of supporters. There are many ways you can support Backyard Ecology, both financially and non-financially. Learn more at www.backyardecology.net slash join dash us. And until next time, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.